Um, so yeah, I'm Emil. Uh, I work at Facebook in London, and I've worked there for about two years. So for two years, I've been working on what's the native UI frameworks team. Um, so a difference between me and maybe a lot of you in the audience is I don't really write JavaScript. Uh, I'm a C developer. Uh, I write a lot of C and Java and Objective-C, basically. And I dabble sometimes. So don't laugh too much as my JavaScript code, basically, is what I'm saying. Um, as Mike said, I've been developing Yoga for the past two years. And Yoga is the underlying layout engine used in uh, a lot of our frameworks at Facebook, and one of them being React Native. So looking at React Native, what makes it being called native? Well, as we can see, JavaScript is less than 40%. There's Java, C, C++, Objective-C, Objective-C++, and you know, other Bash scripts stuff that probably doesn't run on device. Um, so there's a lot of stuff that isn't JavaScript here. And actually, most of the infrastructure that your apps run through is native. It's mostly the product code that is in JavaScript. Now, this is a bit cheating because this includes both iOS and Android. So for this talk, I'm going to be focusing on Android because it's easier to focus on one platform. But most of the things I'm saying here today will apply to both iOS and Android, and potentially Windows and other targets that I'm not as familiar with. I'll call out things, though, that uh, may be different between the platforms. So languages, for example. We don't run Objective-C on Android. Uh, for Android, we run JavaScript, Java, C++, and C. And this is just in the React Native framework. Your apps probably go through more compilers than this and more languages. I know a lot of you use TypeScript, Flow, or one or two of you might even use Reason. So this is yet another language or two on top of this that your apps are running to display your UI. So yeah, your apps run through at least four runtimes and languages before displaying your UI. And it's the UI portion I'm going to be focusing on today. The native layers of React and React Native have a lot of interesting pieces. Um, everything from like networking to the bridge implementations. Um, there's a lot of interesting things. But the part I know best is the UI part. So I'm going to be focusing on that. Oops. There we go. Um, so what I'm going to be covering is how does your JS code, your React code, your JSX uh, definitions, how do they translate to views on screen in your Android application, views that your users interact with? For this, and I mean, hold your applause, yes. This is only my first React Native app. Um, for this, we're going to use this demo app. It's a simple Hello World app, nothing revolutionary, has a button press me, when we press this button, it shows the text, Hello React Native EU. And yes, this is actually one of my first React Native apps because I'm mostly developing the frameworks and I don't get a jump into product too often. But it's a pretty good experience. And the code is pretty nice. I've skipped over the boilerplate of class declarations and setting up the React Native views. But we have a press event which sets this state, toggles the hello state to true. It ha we have some styles for the container and the text, setting padding and font size. And then we have your, our JSX. Uh, this includes a view, the container, a text that is optionally rendered based on the state, which starts out at false. And then we have that button with the text press me. So the first thing that happens to this code is it runs through React. Uh, and we use React.js. And I'm not going to be covering this, because this has covered, been covered a bunch of times by my colleagues and a bunch of times by people in the community like yourselves. But one thing I did want to cover is what React is. In essence, it takes 
two trees and produces the difference of those trees. So in our case right now, we're rendering our app for the very first time. So we don't have a tree. So the difference is, of course, our initial tree. Now, the output, this difference that React produces, is uh, modeled as imperative commands. To understand what the, uh, what the React algorithm is outputting and what messages get sent from the JavaScript side of React Native to the native side, we're enabling spy mode on the, on the message queue. So to um, communicate between JavaScript and native, we use uh, a message passing system. And spy mode just logs all the messages to the console, uh, whether you're on iOS or Android. So let's see what the console output for this. The messages that are being sent are UI manager messages. These are messages in response to the diff output by React. This diff is telling us how to go from our previous state to our new state. And remember, our previous state was nothing, because this is the first time we're rendering our UI. It tells us to create two views, set them to children, create some more views, set them to children, and on. Each of these calls passes an ID, a type, and some parameters. Uh, for create view, it passes the props of that element. You can see here the top one has a prop text, press me. Uh, an interesting thing to note here is that press me is capitalized, even though we specified the text uh, to be lowercase. And this is because these get output after React has run. And the button component in React is implemented in JS, and it itself capitalizes this text. So this is implemented in all JavaScript, and we only get the, the final result. So what happens with these commands is something, we build up something called the shadow tree. And this is the same on Android and iOS. So the shadow tree is a representation of the UI that is mutable on the native side. So this lives in Java. The shadow tree is built up from these UI manager commands iteratively, and it is what gets translated into our final UI on screen. But we're not there yet. Currently, we don't have a shadow tree. Again, this is the first time we're rendering any anything. So we're going to go ahead and together build up this shadow tree from the UI manager commands that we received from JavaScript. We start with the UI manager create view command. It tells us to create a view with the ID 708, type RCT raw text, a root ID of 41. This is not important now. And the prop text press me. So we do what it says. We create that React virtual text shadow node. So how do we know how to what node to create? Well, we looked at the view manager associated with the RCT raw text type. So view manager, which I'll cover the interface more clearly later on, but is an interface that is implemented for every kind of primitive type in React Native, specifying which shadow nodes to create, how to update properties, and so forth. Next, the UI manager told us to create an RCT text. This one has the next ID. These are just auto-incrementing. 709. It sets some color, text alignment, and, and some other uh, accessibility properties and so forth on this node. So we do what it says, and we create that text shadow node. Now, you might be wondering why we have two nodes, but we only had one text. And that's an implementation detail of React Native. So all text in React Native uh, is rooted in a React text shadow node. However, you can have hierarchy of text, um, often for styling. Say you want a piece of your text to be bold, a larger color, or, a, uh, or red. These are implemented using spanables, or virtual text shadow nodes. So each text is at least two nodes. 
one virtual shadow node, which is rooted in a text shadow node. But if, for example, the press text in our button was bold, this would be two virtual text shadow nodes within one text shadow node. The next thing the UI manager tells us to do is to connect these two nodes. So it calls set children on ID 709 with a, an array of children containing only 708. Now, if you remember those numbers, which I don't expect you to do, this is telling the React text shadow node to be the parent of the virtual text shadow node. And we continue like this. The UI manager tells us to create an RCT view. We look up the view manager associated with RCT view. The view manager tells us to create a layout shadow node, and we set the props on that. Again, the UI manager sets, tells us to set the children, and then it tells us to create yet another RCT view, this time the outer container that had that padding of 20 pixels. And lastly, we connect those two. So as you can see, these are like very imperative commands telling us step by step what to do. So while you write declarative code using JSX, React or JavaScript tells the native side how to do things step by step, one thing at a time in a very imperative fashion. So now that we've use these UI manager commands to build up our initial version of the shadow tree, we're one step closer to showing our UI on screen. But the next step we need to do to be able to show these on screen is actually know where to show them, how big the text should be, and just how your UI should be positioned. For this, we have yoga. So yoga is, as I said before, the layout engine that we use all across Facebook and all across our open source libraries and that the community has adopted in many community open source libraries. The goal of Yoga was to be a blazing fast implementation of a subset of CSS, mainly Flexbox, optimized for mobile, optimized to be fast, and optimized to be portable, to be used across any platform and any framework easily. This is why Yoga is written in portable C code, so it can bind to any language and any platform. And we've optimized the performance for Android, iOS, and other mobile systems where we know certain things are expensive. So Yoga is used in, for example, Litho, which is a React-style framework that I've worked on for Android. Component Kit, which is also a React style framework for iOS, and it's also used in React Native, of course. This is something I've been working on for the past two years, so this is the part I know best. Uh, and uh, if you have any questions about it later, I'm happy to answer them. So, what we do is we create one yoga node per shadow node, almost. As you can see here, we actually have three yoga nodes for four shadow nodes. And that goes back to what I said about text before. So you can have a hierarchy of text, uh, applying different text styles within a block of text. But you can't actually use margins and flex attributes to position those styled text elements. So there's really no need to create a yoga node for it. Instead, we only create a yoga node for that root block of text, which is the React text shadow node. Again, yoga is implemented in C. So now we're actually taking that JavaScript element hierarchy or element tree. We converted that to a shadow node tree in Java memory space. And now we're actually creating a mirror of that tree in C, in native memory using yoga. So this goes through JNI, a C++ layer to make JNI easier, and then finally it lands in C, where the API looks somewhat like this, where we create a node ref for the container. We set some padding on it. Again, this is our outer container, exactly what we specified in JavaScript, but now in a mutable C API. We create that button container. We add it as the first child of the container. We create a text. We set it to have a measure function. 
Now, this measure function is actually a pointer back to Java code to be able to measure the text using the Android APIs. So while we've gone down to C, we go up back to Java and go back down to C again. Uh, this like collaboration between the languages happens all over the place. It allows us to share code efficiently and also implement efficient algorithms uh, in, in the correct like subsystems. Finally, we insert that text within the button and we call YG node calculate layout. So calculate layout, this function is what triggers the Flexbox calculation. And once this function returns, uh, the yoga tree will have mutated and will know its final positions. It will know its frames on screen uh, relative to its parent. So what we have now is we have this shadow tree. They have associated yoga nodes, and the yoga nodes have associated bounds. So now we know the components that we want to show on screen, we know where to show them on screen, and we know how big they should be on screen. So now we're getting really close to being ready to display our UI for the first time. But first, let's have a look at that view manager I talked about um, before. So the view manager is an interface that knows how to translate these types that we get sent from JavaScript uh, into uh, certain views and shadow nodes in the native part. So you can see here each view manager knows how to create a shadow node, how to create a view, how to update views, how to receive commands, and so forth. There's many shadow node, or there's many view managers implemented in React Native, for example, for inputs, views, texts, and so forth. And you can implement your own. So if you have a custom view written in Java or Objective-C, you can implement a view manager. And this is how you bind from JavaScript to a native view component on the platform. So we don't actually call this view manager directly, though. First, we go through something called the native view hierarchy optimizer. And in very Java-esque fashion, it's verbose and says exactly what it's doing. It optimizes the native view hierarchy, if you didn't get that. So this is actually one of those things that does not exist on iOS. And that's because, well, Android views are just a bit heavier. They take a bit more memory. They suck a bit more performance out of your apps. So we need to optimize them to get that performance that we want. Now, I'm not saying this would be worthless to do on iOS. We've just not had the reason to do it yet. So views on Android, they take a lot of memory. When you, your system takes a lot of memory, it slows down. It takes longer time to alloc memory. And it just takes longer time to free memory. There's more garbage collection runs. The whole system becomes worse. So we want to use as little memory as possible, especially on low-end devices. Not only that, but drawing hierarchies in Android or in any platform that I've seen is all about tree traversal. You traverse the view hierarchy, calling draw on each view. So of course, the more view, view, views we have, the more times we call draw. And even a no-op draw is still going to take some time on the processor. So we kind of thought, what views don't we need to create? We haven't created the views yet. Remember, we only have a shadow tree and a yoga tree. What, can we, what do we need to create views for and what don't we? So let's kind of think about what views are used for in Android. A view in Android is used to measure, layout, and draw UI components. But if you've been paying attention, yoga does two of those three things. Yoga measures and layout, lays out nodes on the screen. So we don't need views to do those things. Uh, we can rely on that in yoga. Now, this gives us already many benefits, such as being able to actually perform these operations on the background thread, which is something I've not covered here. So it's already worth it. But we may be able to uh, exploit that even more. And we do this by looking at a node, a shadow node, and asking it, do you have any properties associated with yourself that would cause you to draw something? Or is your draw operation going to be a no-op? 
for things like containers that typically only, say, add padding, like in our case, they wouldn't actually draw anything on screen. They're only responsible for changing the layout of your application. They won't actually draw any color to the pixels. So why do we need them? And the answer is we don't. Uh, we kind of optimize those away. So in this example, we have this blue container. We want to create a grid of red squares. Uh, currently, React Native supports Flexbox, and Flexbox does not support grid layouts. So we have to have kind of a column of rows. To, and this looks great. We get the UI we want, but now we have these rows that aren't really going to be drawn. They're just there so we can get the grid we want. And the native URK optimizer recognizes this. It sees that, hey, you don't have a background color on these rows, for example. You have nothing that will end up in pixels on screen. So we're just going to not care about those. And we just skip over them, and the resulting layout will look as we want it, but it won't have those intermediate rows. Again, this saves a ton of memory and just improves system performance overall. So in our case, we went from four shadow nodes to three yoga nodes to two Android view nodes. In this case, a view group for that button and a text view containing that text. Now we're ready for the best app ever. Thank you. Um, we're not quite done yet, though. Uh, if this was all React did, it would kind of be boring. React is all about efficient updates. So let's look at what happened when we press that button. Again, we're going to say hello to all of you. The code looks something like this. And this is the text we're adding. So we're adding this text. Again, React works the way, so you're actually going to re-render everything, creating a new element tree. But React does efficient diffing. And this efficient diffing propagates all through the native stack. And this is what React Native is built on. So you can get really smooth applications, even though you're using this declarative React model to build your applications. When we press that button, before React re-renders, something else actually happens. The UI manager kicks in right when we press down on that button and says, dispatch view manager command. In this case, it sends command two with the parameter true, then command one with a point location, then command two again with false. I'll be honest, I actually didn't look up what exactly these were because I added these last night. But I'm pretty sure the first one sets the button to pressed. The second one sets the location of the press. This is how Android's ripple drawable, the background that ripples out on buttons, works. You have to set a location for the press. And then finally, when that, you lift up your finger, it calls back and says, hey, I'm not pressed anymore. Now, these commands go to the UI, through the UI manager into the view manager for the correct view, in this case, that button container. And they actually bypass the shadow tree and bypass the yoga tree to do efficient direct manipulation of the views already on screen. And this is how we do efficient animations and press state changes like this. We know ahead of time that this is not going to change the, the layout. This is not going to change the UI in a drastic way. So we actually can just skip over all that hard stuff and just do set pressed true. Uh, and this is a lot quicker. All this so we have a lower chance of skipping a frame and can execute your product code quicker. But let's go back to React. So when we lift up that finger, our on press handler gets called. That text, or our whole component, gets re-rendered. React notices that that text was added, and now starts calling back into our UI manager. And this looks, again, very similar to what we had before. So we go back to Java and receive these UI manager commands. 
again, you'll see here that our shadow tree here already exists. We are not recreating this tree. We're mutating it. We're incrementally updating this and incrementally changing it to adapt to our new screen. This is how we can officially render UIs and not redraw everything from scratch, every frame. So we mutate our tree with whatever commands the UI manager tells us to do. First, it tells us to create another raw text, this time with our new added text, hello React Native EU. We, again, we have to create that RCT text wrapper uh, that is always the uh, parent of the virtual text shadow node. So we do that as well. Then we connect those two. And finally, the UI manager tells us to manage the children of 7-Eleven. Now, if you don't recall, 7-Eleven is the root of our shadow node hierarchy. And this is, it tells it to put 724, this React Tech shadow node, the new one, as child zero of itself. Now, manage children is a lot like set children, but instead for when creating new nodes, we do this when mutating nodes and changing the children they have, not setting its initial children. And now we're done with this, this new UI, uh, the, the new shadow tree. Again, we've just done the minimal updates to this shadow tree and not recreated anything. However, we created a new uh, text shadow node. So let's jump back into C and create a yoga node for that. We attach that measure function again. This is how it knows how to measure that text. And we insert that child into the container. Again, an important aspect of this is we're reusing that container. We're not recreating the yoga tree. The yoga tree is again mutated. Now our yoga tree looks something like this. The only new node is the one on the right, the React Text Shadow node. The rest is the same as before. As, and this is important because we store a bunch of state in this tree to do efficient updates. So when we call yoga or YG node calculate layout again, this is much quicker than the first time. So when looking at profiles of yoga, somewhere like 50, 60% is actually just measuring text. Measuring text is a hard problem. That's why yoga does everything possible to cache those text measurements and reuse them for the next time. So we can save on that time and allow you to run more application code. So in this case, our button still says press me. So that's not gonna get remeasured. We knew that. So all that happens when we call calculate layout is we measure that new text we shift around the button a bit, but this is incredibly quick, and we're done. So this is a lot quicker than the last time. And again, all changes to the yoga tree are incremental, and all calculations are incremental. So let's go back to the native view hierarchy optimizer. And again, what did that do? Optimize the native view hierarchy. Wrong. We have to de-optimize it now. So we had this view hierarchy, view group, which is the button, and the text view, which was the press me text. So how do we insert this hello text? We, we can't really. We can't insert it into the button. It's supposed to be above the button. What do we do? Well, the native view hierarchy optimizer kind of says, oops, I optimized too early. So it goes and de-optimizes and adds another container on top of this, so we can add that text back in. And I mean, we should still be happy. It optimized our last render. We need to do a bit more work this render, but that's fine. So you can see here, it added a new container on top, so you could insert our hello text view into Android. Uh, the view group for the button and the text view for the button text are the same. We incrementally change the Android view hierarchy as well, because we know when incrementally changing the Android view hierarchy, Android has optimizations for that as well and caches a bunch of stuff. So this uh, just ensures that the performance is optimal. And we're done. We have our app. 
I mean, now we just need to launch it. I don't know if anybody's going to use it, though. Um, but that's it, really. Uh, I want to thank you all for being here and listening to me. And uh, I'll probably be drinking coffee in the back if you have any questions. Thank you.